You ready? Okay. All right, he's ready. Genesis chapter number one, if you will. We're going to go back and look again this morning at Adam and Eve. This will be part two. We're going to have another part about Adam and Eve. We've uh, take the summer, do something we haven't done in a, ever really that I can re remember. Usually I'm in the middle of a series when we go into the summer and we just keep hammering it down. And uh, I remember from prep and delivery from Grace School of the Bible, you're supposed to take a break and not always be heavy on the doctrine and so forth. And uh, supposed to take a break and give people a, a break. And I'm like, well, I can't do that. It's not in, in, ground, in ground in me. But I got to looking at, at Paul and his use of the Old Testament saints and so forth and thought about just go back and look at the stories of the Old Testament. And last week, Genesis 1, we started with Adam and Eve, verse 26. And, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And, and we looked at that issue of the image and the likeness. And the, the image there is not a physical thing. Like I, in, in, we're gonna, when we get over into chapter 3, we'll see that they're clothed in nakedness and they're naked and all this stuff. Well, they were clothed in light. Psalm says that, that that's the God wears light as a garment. Uh, that's Psalms 104, first two verses. But when he talks about image here, he's talking about ownership. Uh, whose image is on the penny, he says to him in Luke. Well, it's Caesar's. It belongs to Caesar's. So the image and, and, and the likeness doesn't have anything about looking like him, because you and I do not look like God, okay? But when God created man here, he created him a three-part person, a three-part being, a trichotomy, a spirit, a soul, and a body. And that's what he's referring to in the likeness and in the image issue. And then in the likeness, or in the image issue, the likeness issue is that God has personality. And, and he has some things that make up who God is. Uh, John, he says, God is a spirit, so he must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So God's a spirit, but God has a personality. The, the three members of the Godhead, they have personality. You can grieve the Holy Spirit, so he can cry, can he? He can grieve, he can rejoice, he can be happy. The Lord rejoiced and was happy. The Father is happy. It, it, you know, the, 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 the verse that says that the, the angels sing with the, with the death of a saint and so forth. So there's, there's personality. In, in God, there's love. There's justice. There's integrity. There's honor. Okay? There's also omniscient and omni and you, you don't have any of that. But he did give us a component of his personality, and that's the issue of volition and the issue of free will. So when he makes man in his image and in his likeness, he says you're going to be a three-part. To, to completely be a human, you have to have a spirit, a soul, and a body, and you're going to have some free will and some volition and some responsibility to do some things, okay? Now, that creation that he made of man exists even today. It's just been marred by Adam's sin, okay? When he made man in his image and in his likeness, when, man, when Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis 3, he doesn't go, okay, we're going to blow all that up. He says, no, that stays. It's just now tainted. It's marred by Adam's sin. That's why, in Ad look over at Genesis 4. We read this, Genesis 5, sorry. We read this verse last time, last week, and, and I, I, when I got home, got to thinking about it, and I don't know if I emphasized it enough with you. In verse 3, and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. Well, after his image, and after his likeness. See how it's the two pieces are there? Okay? What was the image of Adam? Well, it's the same image that God made him in Genesis 1. Spirit, soul, and body. The likeness of Adam now still has the volition and the free will issue, but now what has happened to it? It's been marred with saints, with sin. 
So now instead of being, so when you were born, you know whose image you were created in? Adam's image. Why? Because you have the three components and the issue of volition and free will and some other personality things that are there, but you're marred by Adam's transgression now. That's why in Romans 5, he'll say that from Adam to Moses, death reigned upon them that did not sin after the similitude of Adam. They didn't do what Adam did, but they still did what? Died. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. See, that's now when Moses showed up, what did the law do to him? It taught him that. It brought the fact in that, hey, your sin equals a death. The sin offering, that the sacrifice that they had to make, the scapegoat, when they would bring that, and they would put the sins on the goat and send the goat outside of the camp. They would take that sin offering. They would kill the sin offering and spread the blood out, but they would take the carcass and everything, the meat and all, and take it outside the camp and bury it. They wouldn't eat it because it was designed for sacrifice for sin. It's not good. It's unclean. You don't eat that. Now, when you come in now back into Genesis 1, part 2, see, everybody thinks about Adam and Eve and the story of the Old Testament back here is some, you know, and, and again, I was thinking about it. I, we could just teach this like we do the kids in nursery and Sunday school, but there's so much more going on here than, than just that. So, it got a little heavier than what I anticipated it to be. Because when you talk about Adam and Eve, everybody thinks about him. He's created. By the way, in verse 27, male and female created he them. Originally, there, Adam and Eve were in one person. There was one head over the creation. Then he's going to take Adam, he's going to take Eve out of Adam in chapter 2. We're going to see that here in just a minute. He's going to marry them. Then, that's why in verse 28 now, the commissioning of man, and God blessed them. See that? And God said unto them. This commissioning, because that's what we're going to talk about this morning, the rest of the morning here, is their commissioning. This commissioning is to both of them. But, but they are what? They're man. They're one. And they're, they're, there's a oneness here. And God gives a threefold commission here to them. And he says to them, you're going to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. That means what's got to happen? They got to have a marriage. Then they're going to have a relationship in that marriage that's going to produce children, which is going to become the family dynamic. And marriage is an institution of creation, not the church, not the state, but, but God in creation. And it's designed for man and woman to be one flesh, working together as one. That's why he uses that, that, that pronoun, them. It's a togetherness. It isn't one over here doing one thing and somebody else, their other partner doing it completely, and they're, they're pulling against each other. It's to be working together and, and moving together. Because man... The creation of man, he was to have, the rest of the verse, subdue it and have dominion over it. So there, he, his, man's creation was to have dominion over God's creation. So man was created as the head. The king of creation was man. And what we're going to see here, hopefully, come over to Psalms 8. I'll just show you this passage in Psalms 8. You're going to see that in Adam... He was a king, a priest, and a prophet. He held all of the three offices that are later going to be given to the Lord Jesus Christ as the last Adam. We're talking about the first Adam. Look, if you will, at Psalms 8. Psalms 8, verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and suckling. Yeah, you hear that? That, that the saying that we have, you know, the kids say the darndest things and out of the mouth of babes, it comes right from that passage right there. That's where it comes from. Uh, Hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies and thou, thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. 
When I consider the heaven and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with what? Glory and honor. He's a king. He's the king of creation. Thou madest him to have dominion over thy work, the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever uh, passeth through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Notice when, when David says there, he says, Have you thought about man? Have you, what, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Well, the original creation of man was for him to be what? In control and dominion and subdue and to be the king over everything, isn't he? You remember over there in Job when God looks at Job and says, Hey, how you doing controlling the donkey? How you doing controlling the, the animal life, Job? It ain't doing very good. Man originally was intended to do what? Control all that. Sin mars it. Now he can't. Now, this passage in Psalms 8, especially verse the end of verse 4, 5, Hebrews chapter 2 says is a reference to who? To the Lord Jesus Christ. As who? The last Adam. As the, as the one that is going to come along and, and accomplish for man what man failed to do in the, in the original issue. And when man failed and Adam and Eve dropped the ball in Genesis 3 and they disobey the word of God and they rebel against God's word, Christ comes along and he says, you know what? It's the faith of the Son of God that's going to take care of this and I'm here to do it. And what you see in Christ in his earthly ministry is you begin to see what Adam was designed to originally do and be and look like. And what you and I were originally designed to look like and to do was our will was to be in subjection to the will of the Father and the Word of the Father. And when the Word of God said, do this, our job was to do that and to do it willfully and to do it out of, a, out of an appreciation for everything that we have in Christ. Problem is, is Genesis 3 happened. And sin mars the picture. And when sin mars it, guess what? The first Adam and Adam all what? Die. And the last Adam all what? Live. So now Christ comes along and, he's, and I, I look back at the back wall and see Galatians 2.20 because that's what he says. Hey, when you're operating as who you are in Christ, and when you're thinking about things the way you're supposed to be thinking, you know what you're going to say? It's not I, but Christ. And the life that I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. We call that the faith of Christ. And how did, what was Christ faithful to do? Not my will, Father, but your will is what I'm here to do. I'm not here to do what I want to do. I'm here to do what you, Father, my will is, is that this cup pass me. And if you can't find any other way, I'm still going to go and do what you want me to do. That's how we should be thinking. Adam, come back to Genesis 1. That's the issue here. Is that Christ now has come and do for man what man failed to do, and it starts right back here in Genesis 1. And by the way, ultimately one day, what's Christ going to do? He's going to come back, call the body home, going to come all the way back, set up Israel and the earth, and take care of it, and set it back to this original picture. If you look at verse 28 again, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And the issue from this moment on until we come to the Apostle Paul is going to be about man's activity in the earth. If you come back to chap in chapter 1, 
verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth. And the issue is going to be the earth. And beginning here, God's purpose in the earth is to set up a kingdom with a king, with a priest, and with a prophet. And it's going to start here with Adam and Eve, but with Adam, Mr. and Mrs. Adam. Okay? And it starts here. Verse 28, you have Adam as the king. What's he going to do? He's going to subdue and have dominion, isn't he? Dominion, rule, reign. He's going to be the leading authority. If you come over to chapter 2, in verse 19, chapter 2, in verse 19, Out of the ground of the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. There's the prophet where he expounds on the creation of God. When God made the animal life, he didn't name it. He brought it to Adam. Adam, it's your job to speak for God. It's your job to come in and name these Adams and these animals. And Adam would sit and look at them and, and investigate them and go, you know what? You should be a dog. So your dog is your name. And by the way, you're my best friend. You know, dogs rule and cats drool, right? Yeah, no, okay, cats drool, cats drool and dogs rule. Okay, good. So what happened, he would look and he would say, you know what, that right there looks like a horse. By the way, when they pulled them on, when God made the animals come onto the ark, you remember it's by their kind. So there's a male and a female, so they can have babies later, but it's of the, of the species, it's of the kind. Come over to chapter 3 of Genesis and verse 8. So you got Adam as the king. He's going to have rule and dominion, and, and he's going to subdue. He's the, pre, the prophet. He's going to expound God's creation, and he's going to look at things, and he's going to name them the way God would have them named. And then in verse 8, here's this priesthood. And, the, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And as Ad, Adam and his wife hid themselves. Now, you'll notice, what is, what's the punctuation after the cool of the day? A colon, setting it off, isn't it? I'm going to change the subject here because they're naked and they're, they're height operation fig leaf. We're going to do it our way. We're going to come over here and cover ourselves. But notice that they walked with the Lord Where? The cool of the day, but they heard the voice of the Lord God. There's the priest. He walks with God. He hears the voice of God. By the way, this isn't the first time that the Lord's walked with them. It was right here. He's been walking with them since day six. Okay? By the way, day six, man's created. Day seven, God rested, institutes the Sabbath day. He tells Adam... He's, and, 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 and he tells Israel this later, but he says it to Adam. On the next Sabbath, I'm going to come and bring my city and dwell with you and live with you. Midweek, Genesis 3 happens and the fall. Now, if you want to do an interesting study, line that bad boy up where the Calvary happens and where the cross work happens. It's mid, midweek. When he dies, buried, resurrected, and is out three days. You gotta think about that. So on Thursday, guess what? Eve gets a visit in the garden. You gotta think about that. It shouldn't be lost on you. Come back to chapter one. So God established man in the earth. And again, the earth is gonna be the issue here. And the issue in the earth, again, until we get to Paul, when Paul shows up, when he calls you, when Paul calls you and I a new creature, that shouldn't be lost on you. Because what are we? We're human, aren't we? We're stuck here. What's he gonna do to you and I that he didn't do that that he did with Adam and Eve? He gave them a body, didn't he? He gave them a body to function in the earth. He's going to give us a new body so we can function where? In the heavens, we are a new creation, if you will. A new creature. But we're still what? Human, because what do we have? 
Body, soul, spirit, soul, and body, don't we? We have that com component that makes up humanity. We're just a new species up there. We're a new man, Paul calls us. You don't get that too. Paul, so everything else now is going to be about the earth. So when we look here at Adam, verse 28, Adam, you got a job. You've got to, you, and by the way, if you have volition and free will, which everyone in the room does, then you have responsibility for that. Unfortunately, in our day and age, our young folks have been taught that you're not responsible for anything. Everybody's a winner. Everybody's a winner until you go on the job interview and they say, no, thank you. Or they don't even call you for the job interview. Or you take mommy with you to get the job. And they look at you. We had this here in the school district. We got a young kid come in and mom's right with him. And our head trainer, he's the guy who does all the interviews, looks at her and says, what are you doing here? Who are you? Oh, I'm here to make sure my kid gets a fair shake. He's like, well, you need to sit out there. She goes, well, no, I'm not. He goes, then you don't have the job. Have a nice day. I'm like, "Rue." No, she can't. <laughs> well, she could, I guess, but she didn't. But see, the thing is, is Adam, you got a job now. You're going to be fruitful. Threefold. You're going to multiply. You're going to replenish. So now we have the institution of marriage come on board. And now with marriage, marriage is established. Then you're going to subdue the earth. You're going to subdue it. You're going to come along and you're going to conquer the earth. You're going to have dominion over it, point three. You're going to rule it. Like, so man is designed, man's commission is to fill up the earth, to conquer it, and to rule over it. Now the reason, excuse me, the reason for the, con for the subduing the dominion is the adversary. And we've talked about that, about Lucifer's fall, and the fact that he's now in possession, he's now on the scene. So when the Lord gives Adam this commission of subdue, of multiply, replenish, subdue it, and have dominion, there's an issue about repossessing the earth and the conquest of the earth and the rulership over the earth. When he says there to have dominion over the fish, that is to have rulership, to be the king, to run it, and, and to make it go, and to name it the way it needs to be named, and, and to cause it to work the way it's... So Psalms 8, hey, when something new comes down, what was man to do? Set it on its course. Man is to subdue it. Come over to Numbers 32. Tried to find a few other verses than just Genesis, but you're getting the idea. Numbers 32, I hope. Numbers 32. By the way, when the Lord walks with Adam during the week, in the cool of the day, he's educating him on his law. The law of God was given to Adam way before it was ever given to Moses as, a, as an addition to the promise of the covenant with Abraham. The law, of Mo, the law that we understand and read with Moses, Adam was getting on day one. And he's getting educated. Abraham, how in the world does Abraham know to do to, to do a sacrifice to Melchizedek, his, 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 his priest, without there being what? Some education on, here's the sacrificial system, guys. It just wasn't there for their transgression yet. Numbers 32. You've got to keep all that in mind sometimes. Anyway, Numbers 32, verse number 20. And Moses said unto them, If ye will do this thing, if ye will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go all you armed over Jordan before the Lord until he have driven out his enemies from before him. Here's the idea. And the land be subdued before the Lord. Then afterward ye shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and, your, and before Israel, and this land shall be your possession before the Lord. You see that then the land be subdued? But what do they have to do first? They got to go to war, don't they? There's a fight. There's a conquest. 
There, go back to Genesis 1. There, there's, a, there's military terms and concepts that are now going to be taught to Adam because there's an adversary. And Adam, your job is to control the earth and have dominion over it and rule it. By the way, fill it up. You're going to get a wife here in a minute. We're going to have a bunch of kids. You're going to fill this bad boy up. And by the way, you're filling it all up with images of me, of God, not me, Rick, but God, okay? Please don't be me, <laughs> all right? I have a trouble with the three I got, you know? But we're going to do this. But there's an adversary. Genesis chapter 2 if you look at verse 8, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. You see the garden there, eastward in Eden? We call it the Garden of Eden. You know what that garden is? That's a fortress. Verse 15, He tells the, uh, Adam, the, And the Lord took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, protect it. Guard it. Protect it from the enemy. God gave Adam a fortress, a sanctuary to get out of the battle. It was a place of safekeeping for Adam and for him to keep and to protect. And it was designed to be where Adam could come and get a reprieve and to get re-energized, if you will for the battle outside that he was out there doing and accomplishing for in the commission given to him by God. So Adam becomes God's instrument originally to subdue and to conquer and to have dominion and to, to cause the repossession of the land of the earth from the adversary. Now, we know the rest of the story to a degree that it that moves, that responsibility moved to Noah, didn't we? Look, by the way, look over there in chapter 9. This, this is why I'm focusing on this commission. So, because in 9-1, after the flood, guess what old Noah gets? Same thing. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Look at that. What are they to do? They're to go out there and fill that bad boy up again, aren't they? And they're also going to have dominion. You keep reading, and they're going to do. Uh, they're, they're going to uh, verse. Uh, well, verse two and three, they're going to go find the, the. They're going to scatter in the hunting and so forth. And then in verse five and six, you've got uh, capital punishment. There's rulership. There's government showing up. In verse seven, he repeats it, and you be ye fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. And God spake unto Noah and his sons, and, and, and off he goes again with them. But when you come back to Genesis 1, the first thing out of the gate here in the first issue is for them to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish the earth. A couple things there. We're talking about marriage. The second institution of creation is marriage. The first one is volition. It's free will. Everybody has it. It's, it's God-given. You don't have it because some theologian said you don't have it. You have it because God says you have it. Okay? Then he comes along and he says, Adam, in your volition, you've got a job to do. But before you can go do the job, i got a help meet I'm going to make for you here. And now we're over into chapter 2. If you look at verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, and... Man became a living soul, and he plants him in the garden, gives the things there. He's going to give him a, a test of his volition in verse 16 and 17. We're going to look at that next time. Verse 18, and God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And God looks at this situation. Adam begins to name the animals in verse 19 and 20. Verse 21 the Lord, by the way, the end of verse 20, but for Adam there was not found a help meet for him. He's looking around going, wait a minute, there's a, there's a male and a female, but there's nobody here helping me, so what does God say? I, I can fix this. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs to, and closed up the flesh in, in, instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. So you've got woman. Made. 
And woman, the term means simply to belong to man, to be taken out of man. Now the woman comes along and verse 23, And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. By the way, who's Adam's father and mother? He doesn't have one. He's what? Created. Okay. He doesn't have a mom and dad. So what do we see God instituting here? The institution of marriage. What's going to happen from this moment forward is in marriage, the man is going to leave mom and dad and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. What's going to happen? Man, the man, is going to leave the identity of mom and dad, and come over here and get married and form a new identity, a new entity, a new family unit is going to happen. By the way, the woman does the same thing. Okay? But he's talking about the man. The woman was made for who? The man. You, and we're not going to spend the time going back in 1 Corinthians and all that stuff. You, you understand those verses. I'm just trying to get you to see what's going on here in creation. By the way, verse 25, And they were both naked, the man and the wife, and were not ashamed. Well, how could that be? You giggle, you know, first couple nights in the marriage. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're not wise. Sin's not there. See. So, Marriage is instituted. And marriage becomes the basic stabilizing element of society. You want to see the reason why a society falls apart? You go and look at the marriage issues going on in that society, and that's why the society falls apart. Rome was, Rome was brought to its ashes from within because they redefined what marriage was all about. That's why our country's falling apart. They've, the attack on marriage has completely crumbled the foundation of this society. Because what happens when you got mom? Now, marriage has volition in it. Young man sees a young lady and says, mm, maybe. And she goes, maybe not. <laughs> you know? But a little chase, a little court. And what happens? Hey, why don't we spend the rest of our life together serving the Lord? Okay, cool. And we get married. Now, 1 Corinthians 7, for us in the body, deals with marriage. Ephesians 5 and so forth does too, and 6. Okay? It's a wonderful thing. The only, the only requirement to get married today in the age of grace, according to 1 Corinthians 7, is that they be in the Lord. Now, we, we put a little bit more, understand right division, use the King James Bible, go to my church and all this stuff, right? God doesn't do that. He says they, they just have to be in the Lord. If they're not in the Lord, you know what's going to happen? Trouble. Chaos. Because you're going to say, we're going to do this, and they're going to say, no, we're not. And there's going to be a, a fight of who's in charge. Who's the head of the family? The man is. Who's the head of the marriage? The man is. Who's the head of the family? Mom and dad, the parents. That's why it's children obey your parents. Okay? It's dad's job to raise them, but mom and dad are to work together in that family unit. And I'm getting ahead of myself because in chapter 4, what does Adam do with Eve? 4-1. Adam knew Eve. How you doing, Eve? Nice to meet you. No, nah, it's not that. <laughs> this is marriage. People are real squirmish about the use of the word sex. And it's, it's not defiled when it's in the, marriage room, in the marriage bed. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the, from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. So now they have what? Now they're having children. And, the, and what, is the, what is the commission? Replenish, subdue, replenish, multiply, fill this bad boy up. So we got marriage. We got volition, you're going to choose your mate, and together you're going to go have kids, and you're going to repopulate. And marriage becomes the stabilizing element in the basic building blocks of society, and family are developed as the third institution to come along and then to protect and to safeguard mankind. 
Because when you quit having kids, what happens? You eventually die, and it goes away. One of the greatest things we've ever seen in our lifetime has been China, one-child policy. Everybody goes, oh, that's horrible. You know what's even more horrible? Roe versus Wade. And the legislated killing of babies in this country. Greatest genocide never, ever, ever, ever to happen, to never be tried in the court of public opinion as a bad thing has been abortion. You think about that. What are we supposed to be having? We're supposed to have kids. So now we pull the Roman Catholic thing and we have, don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. no. If you can't pay for them, don't have them. Sorry. Something I learned the hard way. But I'm glad I had them. Don't get me wrong. Then you got family. Then what happens, come over to chapter 10. Racing clock says move along. Chapter 10 of Genesis. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And under the sons were, bo- were born, and, and unto them were, bo- were sons born after the flood. And then you get this little thing here. Drop down with me to verse, well, verse 20. We'll just use verse 20. Now, uh, these are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their, what? Nations. The fourth institution of creation is the issue of nationalism. And nationalism is designed to, government is designed to protect volition, marriage, and the family. That's what government is designed to do. You go read Romans 13, and Paul talks about government, and it's to subdue, it's to, it's to deal with the evil and to promote the good. Well, what would be good? Families and marriages and volition, free will. Come over here and take care of the evil. So then you have nationalism, where people are gathered together, designed to protect the first three institutions. Now come back to Genesis 1, because that's what's going on here in 128 in the commission. All of this is laying out for you. All of this is moving here. Adam, you got a job to do. You're going to go be responsible. You know what you're going to have? You're going to have a you're going to use your volition to marry this young lady that's going to come here. And you guys are going to have, by the way, when he saw Eve, he what did he say? Oh, you're the woman for me. <laughs> She's the only one there. You know, it's got to work, right? Wait, you guys okay? It's only Sunday morning. Man, you know? I had a guy ask me one time, should I? He, friend of mine, real good friend of mine, and he says, I'm going to marry the first blonde that walks through the door. And it was a guy who walked through. He goes, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm going to, no, it's not like that. He says, Adam, this is what you're going to do. You got a job to do. We have an adversary in the scene. You're going to go down there and you're going to have volition. You're going to use your free will. You're going to get married. You're going to have a family. You're going to repopulate. You're going to multiply. You're going to replenish the earth. You're going to fill that bad boy back up for me. And you're going to be in there and you're going to be creating uh, family, uh, children and, and, and descendants that are going to have my image and my likeness in them. And then you're going to come along and you're going to subdue it. And you're going to come along and you're going to have to go to war with that adversary and you're going to have to fight him and you're going to have to subdue him and put him in his place. And you keep control over it. You have dominion over it. You're the king. You're the crown of creation. You got to do this, Adam. And I'm here to help you. And you see that in in chapter 1, verse 29. And God said, Behold, I have given you. See that? I'm here to help you, Adam. You do what I tell you to do. You obey my word to you. And you know what will happen? You'll have victory at every turn. And we'll repossess this thing and we'll deal with that guy over there. And we'll put him in his place where he belongs. And next week I'm going to come down here and I'm going to sit with you. And I'm going to be Emmanuel with you. I'm going to be God with you. And I'm going to dwell with you. And you and I are going to live together. And I'm going to dwell with a creation that is in their free will desired to serve and to worship and do and me. And Adam, you're the guy.
And you know what old Lucifer does, old Satan does? Not so fast. Because he's the adversary, isn't he? Chapter 2, God looked, the, verse 15, And the Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man. Okay, Adam, I'm here for you. I'm here with you. I'm going to help you. I got a word for you. Okay. Let's see how you're going to do in obeying my word to you. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. Wow. Look at that. You look, he, he's got this big old garden. He's got every tree and herb known to man that he can eat and live on and partake of. It's all there. Could you imagine the imagination and the ingenuity? How many different ways could you have a, an, an apple? How many different ways could you have a peach that's perfect every time you pick it? <laughs> you know? Adam gets out there and he's dressing it and keeping it and he brings in Eve a, a, a basket of, of beautiful, golden, delicious apples for Granny Smith's. And she goes, well, what am I supposed to do with that? And he goes, you know what, honey? I don't know. Surprise me. I'll see you this evening. He goes off working. What is she doing? What does this bozo want me to do with this today? No, she's not saying. She comes up and she makes a great apple pie and an apple cobbler and some apple juice, some apple strudel. What else? Apple sauce. She's working it out. And you know what? Adam comes in through the door and goes, man, does it smell good in here? What's cooking? Good looking. And she sits, he sits down, and you know what he does? He enjoys it. And then he goes, well, I got tomorrow's here for you, and it's peaches. You make a peach pie and a peach cobbler. And she starts all off, and it's all, and you know what God said? God didn't say you got to make applesauce. He just says, of all the trees you can what? Freely eat. The provision by God is, is endless. Verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good for... See how he just switches subject in the next verse? See that? God says, I got a command for you, Adam. I set you up. I'm here for you. I made this wonderful provision. Now, will you just obey me? Will you use your volition, your free will, your marriage, your family to do what the Word of God says for you to do? Will you do that, Adam? Will you do it? Now, next week we'll look at the chapter 3. Because you know what Lucifer does with that issue of volition is he goes, yeah, come on in here, hang on a minute. I've got an answer for that issue. And he attacks volition with, yea, hath God said. And he brings doubt into volition. And then in chapter 3, he brings doubt and, 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 and uh, turmoil into the marriage. Because now what was harmony in the garden with the apples and with the peaches and with the apricots and with whatever else, the pecan, could you, ooh, the pecan pies, ooh, man, with all of that. Now there's, a, now there's a conflict in there. Because what did Lucifer say? Yea, hath God said. Then he's going to go over in chapter 4, and he's going to mess with the family, with Cain and Abel. See? And all of it is to go against what God said. And then ultimately in Genesis 11, with the Tower of Babel and the one language, one world language, and universalism is the attack by Satan on nationalism. All that's going on right here. Way more than just Adam and Eve in the garden, kicking it around. We'll look at that test in, chap in chapter 3 next time. By the way, it wasn't an apple that she ate. It was a grape. I'll show you that next time. Get you, I got to get you to come back next week, you know.
the hook to come back. But it's right here. We'll look at Genesis 3 and the fall and what's going on there with Adam and Eve. And then we'll look at Cain and Abel quickly. And then we're going to move to Noah. Look at Noah real quick. And we're going to go Nimrod back to Cain and Nimrod. And we'll look at Nim oh Nimrod. Because Nimrod in Genesis 10 and 11 is where Romans 1 shows up where God gave them up. And that's a big issue in Paul's gospel is that look at what God did. He gave mankind over to themselves because in Genesis 12, he goes to Abraham and starts his own nation and he gives up the nations and the nations, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God and they buy right into the satanic policy of evil and off they go and set the course of this world. It's all right here. It starts all right here. And all we can think about is the Sunday school picture book with Adam and Eve in the garden and a snake wrapped around an apple tree and her holding it and him going, <laughs> and it isn't that at all. So much stuff going on here. So we'll do all that, not next time, but the next couple weeks, okay? A lot going on in this stuff. And then we'll see where we go from there, okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you that we have your word, that we can study it, we can look at it, we can see your original intent with Adam and with Eve and how it blossoms and moves over into us as we are your new creatures and your new creation of the body of Christ for the heavenly places and how that our relationship back to this is just as important as Israel's because we're your people. In your name we pray. Amen.